Thanks everyone for joining us tonight for the kickoff for our 2020 Providence Symposium. This has uh, become a uh, biennial event. And this year we are of course testing out um, new technology and a new way of doing this. So I wanna appreciate your, your time and your interest in the program. Before getting underway, we want to acknowledge the Providence Preservation Society is situated on the ancestral and unceded lands of the Narragansett Nation. This acknowledgement reminds us of the significance of place, the continued existence of indigenous people and PPS's commitment to building respectful relationships with those who call these lands home today. This year's symposium explores the systems and inequalities that have shaped our built environment and the communities that inhabit it. In particular, we're thinking about the events of the past year. Um, it's never been more important to reflect on whose places have historically been prioritized and for us to recognize what needs to change moving forward. The interdisciplinary approach to this year's symposium gives us a good framework for thinking about the intertwined nature of issues such as climate, housing, design, transportation, reflective diversity, and historic preservation, and their possible solutions. The preservation movement has had to reorient itself around the questions people care about in order to affect meaningful change in our neighborhoods and cities. The next program in the symposium Tomorrow at 3 p.m. is Who Decides What's Worth Saving? Tickets are still available on our website and we hope you'll join us. This session is being recorded. We encourage you to enter your questions and comments in the chat box on your screen. And at the end of the program, we'll get to many of them as we can. We wanna thank our sponsors this evening. Shown on your screen in particular, our partners in preservation, our year round sponsors, Residential Properties, Brown University, Kite Architects, LLB Architects, and our session sponsors for the symposium, AIA Rhode Island and Art Pack Services, Inc. And as this is our first program, I do wanna give uh, acknowledgement to all of our sponsors, including David Abbott, Adler's Design Center and Hardware, Marba Sokoloff Associates, Blue Dog Capital, Maya Farish, Heritage Restoration, Inc., Landscape Elements, LLC, Public Archaeology Lab, Puro Clean, and Washington Trust. Uh, without them, our programming would not be possible, so we really uh, thank them for their support. This evening, we are joined by Pascal Sablon. We have shared her biography with you on our website, so I want to share with you the portion of her biography that spoke to us when we were planning the symposium. I first heard her speak on a panel discussion at an AIA Connecticut program on bias, racism, and inequality in the architecture, engineering, and construction industry. I found her uh, as a panelist to be really inspiring, both because she is not afraid of directly confronting systemic inequalities, but also because she takes action to affect positive change. And in particular, she is the founder and executive director of Beyond the Built Environment, an organization that is positioned to uniquely address the inequitable disparities in architecture by providing a holistic platform aimed to support numerous stages of the architecture pipeline. And although her organization and our talk are focused on the field of architecture, there are lessons to be learned for all of us. So tonight, um, Pascal will speak for about 45 minutes, leaving time for questions at the end. We appreciate you keeping your video and microphone off throughout her talk. And again, as you have thoughts and comments, please put them in the chat box. Uh, so Pascal, welcome, and I will we'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for that generous introduction. I appreciate it and glad to know that that panel discussion uh, created an opportunity to engage with you all. Um, my name is Pascal Sablon and I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen for you. Um, don't judge me about my tabs. Um, okay, hopefully this works, perfect. Um, I am the uh, founder and executive director of Beyond the Built Environment. I'm a senior associate at S9 Architecture. I'm the NOMA National Historian, the NOMA National Northeast Regional Vice President. And as, as last month, I am now elected president-elect of NOMA National um, of the organization. I'm also AIA New York uh, Board of Director and AIA National Strategic Planning Committee member, which helps uh, wrote the strategic plan for the organization to follow for the next five years. 
And through these different organizations that I'm a part of, and I wear these fancy hats towards and leverage my power of leadership, it really allows me to be knowledgeable about the issues that are plaguing our membership and our communities and society. It also gives me an opportunity to get involved and to um, give back and to volunteer. And in that effort, I was able to really get to mentor and participate in programs like K through 12 that AIA has or um, Project Pipeline, which is a NOMA in initiative. And these are programs where we really introduce the profession to these little kids. And I think to myself, man, as they left, as excited with their little models of what architecture and design can be, um, what happens when they try to look into this profession further? So if you Google the word great architects, because I'm assuming that's what little kids do, <laughs> uh, Google banner comes up with these beautiful faces and names. On this screen is the first 40 names out of, I believe, 50 that they ultimately provide. And as you can see that this list is uh, ranging from both contemporary to um, you know, a really long breadth of time. You have architects listed as Raphael and Michelangelo. So in this list of, of 40 designers, great architects, how many are women? One. And so between now and when architects win Ninja Turtles, there's only been one woman who's done anything of significance in the realm of architecture. Okay, now how many do you think are African-American? That's right, zero. <laughs> we got nine minorities. Zaha is clutch. Uh, she holds it down in those two categories. But really, if a, a little kid who looks like me came to Project Pipeline or a K through 12 program or such and went to research it, they would immediately be told that they can't, right? You can't be what you can't see, right? And so is it true? Absolutely not. Here are 40 amazing African-American architects who've uh, done amazing work for the, the society, the world, globally, nationally. Um, and if you have the ability to, I highly recommend that you print screen to capture them people that you should definitely get to know and understand their work. And I promise you, you're actually probably familiar with their work. You just didn't know that they were the, the, the identities behind them. Coupled with that, I went to the, um, I went to Google's headquarters and I said, cause it's located in New York. So conveniently enough, um, I asked them, hey, why does this happen when I Google the words great architect? And they said, honestly, Pascal, there's not enough content out there that lists you all as great. And that struck me from, for a while, right? And as that was resonating in my soul, I also had the uh, pleasure of listening to Dr. Adelaide Sanford in her Afrocentric Education as a Human Rights speech. And in this speech, she talked about and introduced me to a very important figure, Albert Schenker. Albert Schenker was the president of the Federation of Teachers from 1964 to 1997, give or take. This is a person that is highly regarded. People really love him. He's done uh, you know, a lot for the education system, for teachers and unions and such. Um, and he really fought to make education process in public schools as equitable as possible. But to achieve that equity, he has this idea that you need to erase culture. So never let the African-American child learn of his or her history, because if they do, they relate more to their ethnicity and they will not become an American. So understanding that A, according to Google, there's just not enough content out there calling us great. And B, the person that's in charge of our education system pretty much set up, set up a, a mandate or a system that erased our culture and our individuality my role in trying to solve this is a series of say it loud exhibitions. Now, a little key for this presentation is when I'm trying to explain the issue, those are black and white pages with punches of color. Um, the pages that are yellow are the stuff that I'm personally doing to make a change. And then the cyan pages are what I'm striving to do in the future. Um, and that is kind of like the first lesson, which is we don't have to wait till we've completely accomplished everything before we're able to change, uh, share our progress and talk about it. You never know that who's in your audience is part of your community that will actually help it come to fruition. So first yellow page is a Say It Loud New York exhibition. The concept of this exhibition is to see our face, hear our voices and feel our impact within the colorful tapestry of our uh, heritage. So to see our faces, we created nice big headshots next to the labels of each project. So you not just saw our name, but you saw what we look like. Here are voices. We had video testimonials on other end of the gallery that had the designers speaking to their experiences and what propelled them into the profession. 
and then feel our impact is through the work, which is what we ultimately want you to know us and, and, and respect us from, right? Um, and so I really wanted this exhibition to be uh, bright, vibrant, loud, if you will. Um, and it was a really amazing opportunity to elevate 22 diverse designers of, of New York. While that was happening, someone from the United Nations actually came to see the exhibition and invited us to exhibit at the UN uh, Center um, in New York, Visitor Center in New York. And it was an incredible opportunity. They definitely had more restrictive brightness <laughs> uh, rules that I could not break. So it's a little bit more subdued than I'd like, but I was relishing the opportunity to really elevate these prominent designers um, in this global platform and really get visibility to them. Um, and then they said, hey, Pascal, do you want to give a little speech for the opening? Oh, of course I do. So I leverage the power of the podium to not just thank those who made this exhibition happen and to acknowledge the designers that were in the room, but to actually ask the world leaders in the space to understand that representation matters and that I needed their help to make this a national movement. And before I got back to my seat, they said, Pascal, we'll make this an international movement. Uh, and also in 2018 was the AIA conference in New York, um, ironically enough, one block away from my job at S9 Architecture. And I submitted two panel ideas as well as a Say Aloud exhibition, and they all pretty much got rejected. Um, and the statement and the reasoning behind that was that the panels and the content was too specific to one demographic and not inclusive enough, um, and therefore wasn't viable to, you know, elevate to one of the esteemed programs in the conference. So I took that no and I squeezed it until I got a yes out of it. First, I asked the S19, can I take over our conference rooms for two days? Um, and they said, absolutely, whatever you need. And then I called the UN. I said, hey, are you guys done with the exhibition boards and models? Because if so, I have another exhibition I want to do. They said, say less. And they sent over the stuff. Um, then I said, AIA, can you put on your app about the exhibition and they could potentially come see it uh, in my office, which is only one block away. And they said, no problem. So I was able to leverage our network, the app, and a series of yeses from other people to create a Say It Loud A18 exhibition and to host these panel discussions that was highly attended. So it was super dope to make that happen, even though I started with a no. And then, true to their word, uh, the UN in hired. Um, uh, translators and translated our exhibition into eight different languages. And that's how you say, say it loud in all those languages in the middle of your screen there. And then March 25th, 2019 was Say It Loud Day Worldwide, where UN information centers invited professors and students to come see the exhibition in a language that they can understand and digest the information. This blew my mind. I cannot tell you how many tears came out of my eyes when the pictures and the list of all these spaces around the world, most of which I can't pronounce, were saying it loud. Um, but also in that moment, I did a self critic critique about understanding that it was time and important that I stopped elevating the same 22 people um, and really expanded beyond that. And so what we started to do is engage spaces and venues that weren't necessarily architecture specific, but people who appreciate design. So with South by Southwest, uh, we have hosted an exhibition. And part of our metrics of kind of strategizing how successful this exhibition was, is that I created a people's choice competition. And so when people would come in, they would kind of glance at things. I'm like, oh, we got to vote for your favorite. And when they knew their vote counted, they went back and they read each one, took the time to look at it and indicated their, their favorite designer. So through this process, physically, I was able to count about a thousand people who walked through the space at the time of the exhibition. But then online, I actually had 6,000 votes. So it realized at this particular moment that I was able to elevate not just in the physical platform, but also in a virtual one as well. And there, Michael Marshall was our very first People's Choice Award winner. Um, and then the following year, in June of 2019, guess who got invited to the AIA party? Um, and we got a prominent location, lots of wall space to say it loud, if you will. And the president of AIA at the time, Bill Bates, made it a point to come over and say it loud as well. So, you know, it just goes to show a no doesn't necessarily need to determine your trajectory of what the work that you do. As you can see, I love to talk. Uh, Brent kind of told you that already. So leveraging those re relationships and requests for me to do keynotes and, and lectures, I also say, hey, if you're interested in what I'm saying, can you also support the mission? 
So when I was invited by Architecture Exchange East Conference to keynote in front of 750 people, I was able to get a Say It Loud Virginia exhibition as part of the efforts, which is pretty dope, in November of 2019. Also in November, we had Say It Loud Pennsylvania. Now at this point, somebody came to me and said, Pascal, if the whole idea is to um, introduce the profession and, and the heroes to local communities, members, how are they supposed to get to you at Center for Architectures and United Nations and South by Southwest and conferences that have paying um, paywalls, right? So how do you make it more accessible? And that was like the best comment ever because it really shook like me uh, losing sight of the mission um, and kind of gearing it back. And I shared that concern with uh, Noma PGH, which was our uh, local community group that helped kind of organize Say It Loud Pennsylvania. And they took that and ran with it. They picked a gallery space that was community centered, completely open on, on the weekends so people can access. Um, they planned programmings like you would not believe, keynotes, panel discussion, networking events, youth days. Every other day I was getting more emails, more pictures, more activities of how they really activated um, Say It Loud. Also in November of 2019, we did Say It Loud Illinois um, in, um, in, uh, in Chicago. And we were invited by INOMA and the Community Builders Group who host and, ho and run a series of community centers throughout the state of Illinois. And so with this exhibition, we're able to elevate women and diverse designers of Illinois People like um, uh, Dina Griffin and you know Jeannie Gang. It was just it, um, amazing the talent that submitted and want to be featured in this exhibition. And it was supposed to be up for a month. It ended up being up for four months. The community kept requesting it and really wanted it to stay up as long as humanly possible. And even voted to have their MLK Day of Service in this space as well. So what you're seeing in the middle of your screen there is a community group activity that they wanted to organize uh, so that the kids and the community get to see the great work as well. Uh, January of this year uh, was Say It Loud Georgia, which was our first school of architecture. I cannot express to you how hard it is to get a school of architecture to agree to an exhibition that's focused on, a, on women and diverse designers, but that's a whole other talk. Um, but what I was really proud about this exhibition, aside from that, is that um, we were able to elevate William J. Stanley III and his wife, Ivan New Love Stanley, who had designed and constructed part of the Georgia Tech campus and to be able to have them walk through and have kids ask them questions, students, I should stop calling them kids, um, and really be there and excited was really dope um, and prominent. So I say all this to say, um, it was great to see it make that connection there. Also in February of this year, we had Say It Loud United Kingdom. This was our first international Say It Loud exhibition. Uh, David Ajay submitted, uh, Elsie Uwusu submitted like really amazing prominent talented designers um, in the UK really uh, gathered together and, and submitted for this. And this was in collaboration with the RIBA, which is also known as the Royal Institute of British Architects. And what was interesting in th terms of the conversation that we gathered with this um, was that we were kind of fighting some similar issues, right? So it, it might be something that we need to have global conversations and discussions about to figure out how can we really attack the issue of a lack of diversity and inclusivity in who we elevate and who we learn about. And then March of this year, Say It Loud Ohio, which is by far the largest Say It Loud ever. Um, we hosted it at the Caramu House Theater, which is the oldest African-American theater in all of the country. Totally thought it was the Apollo. Apollo was whites only till like 1930 something, who knew? Um, we got 44 submissions of talented local Ohio-based designers. 32 video testimonials about their experiences and about six months of planning. So excited. And two hours before it was set to open, the governor got on the phone on the TV and said, COVID is cra crazy, y'all. It's time to quarantine, shut it all down. Um, no gatherings larger than 100 can happen moving forward. So we actually, even though we had over 300 people RSVP'd, we only allowed the first 90 to be able to come in and take a look and honestly close the doors right after that. So this is a picture of what my heartbreak <laughs> looks like because there was a lot of work, a lot of talent and you know, really small group of people was able to see it. 
And so since then we've been pivoting and have also launched a series of virtual exhibitions during this quarantine time. And so what we'll have is the designers um, components kind of featured under the tab of each state. And then when you click on it, it takes you to their full web page that tells you who they are, where they're based, um, their bio, who inspires them, their proudest achievements, and then photos of their work. And so my long-term goal here about getting General Society to know us is, you know, a few things. A, if there's any Lego execs on the call, you have a really great architecture series. We just want to make sure that projects designed by women and people of color are also featured. Um, also noticing that a lot of kids' books talk about messaging and activism and education. So leveraging that idea, one of the Beyond the Builds initiatives is the Learn Out Loud Children's Pop-Up Book where we're leveraging the information, the content that we receive from the Say Aloud exhibitions, create illustrations like you're seeing there with Rodney Leon. And then when you turn the page, their project is in pop-up, 3D pop-up form, and it says, I can too. So as the, the kids read the book, it's, I can, I, you know, Rodney Leon is an architect, he's changed the world, and then you turn the page, I can too. And that's an exercise of self-affirmation that you have the capabilities and the possibility of doing this amazing work. Um, because once they start that journey, they'll be told otherwise. The namesake of this lecture is I was asked to stand um, and it's about something to prove, right? And the reason why that is, is because when I was in my second week of School of Architecture at Pratt, um, in a classroom of about 70 students or so, a professor asked me and another student to stand up and said, we would never become architects because we're black and because we were women. Now, in this moment, I was shocked about a lot of things. Number one is that there was only two of us in this entire room that fit that criteria. Uh, the other thing is the audacity of the teacher to make this proclamation without knowing my name, without knowing my capabilities, or without knowing anything about me, uh, truly. Um, and then see, kind of seeing how my peers responded. They just kind of like, okay, and kept it moving. And so just, it made me kind of aware of the weight of my representation, that I would no longer just walk into a room and represent Pascal. Like I will be representing our gender and my race, and I have to do us proud at all times. <clears throat> and when I tell this story, people are often shocked and can't believe that a, a teacher would say that. But when I was able to give these lectures in person, I would ask the audience to stand if they were ever told they couldn't because of their gender and or race. And people are standing. People are standing in schools of architecture. People are standing in professional settings. People are standing. So it's not just something that happens to me. It's something that's happening in the, in the progression of the education and profession. And it's part of the system of oppression that we need to address and hold people accountable and find ways of making sure that this gets eradicated from that messaging. And so why is that possible? Why did the teacher say that, think he can say that? Well, let's think about the demographics. 5% apply of African-American students, 5% get enrolled, but 3% graduate. Maybe 2% are like, you guys are crazy, I like sleep. And this fascination with basswood is unreal, potentially, and that's cool. Or were they asked to stand either more obviously or abruptly or more covertly? And so I really wanted us to dive in and dig into understanding what happened to that 2% um, for us to kind of push forward. The other thing that I've learned based off of the 2019 uh, report from NAB is that 65% of African-American students who graduate with a degree in architecture come out of seven HBCUs. Seven schools create 65% of people that, of African Americans into the profession with a degree. Um, so if we're talking about enforcing the pipeline, that's a really important place to kind of focus on. And what does the professors look like? Okay, well, 2.5% are black, 32% are women. And not to say that you need to have a professor that is your twin for you to learn from them, but just diversity in staff, diversity in peers and classmates will allow for a plethora of values, ethos, design process, projects, references for you to learn and glean from. So really understanding that. And also knowing we're not many, right? Not that we don't exist and that it's not possible, Mr. Professor, but that there's not a lot of us. So how do we expand our existence and our presence? Uh, one way of tracking our progress with how we're doing with in terms of diversifying the profession, profession is the Directory of African American Architects. Um, and that was started by Bradford C. Grant and Dennis A. Mann. And they were tracking this well before 
AIA and NOMA and everybody else started asking those questions. So they're the ones that's able to tell us that we are still only 2% of the profession because every time someone becomes licensed, this is where they enter the information. Now, University of Cincinnati in January was like, you know what, we're bored with this website and we're done paying for it. So we're shutting it down. Um, there was a lot of conference calls, a lot of meetings trying to maintain this directory because really it was the measurement tool of how we know how we're progressing in diversifying the profession. Now, when you type in blackarc.uc.edu, you get site can't be reached, which crushed my soul. But thank you to Noma, uh, they took over the directory. So another good print screen moment. Um, now the website is there, you can have access to the information. And we actually just threshold into 500 African American women architects in the country. Um, and it's really important. So uh, I highly recommend that you take a look and click through and see the names and faces, or oh, no, there's no faces, just names in this directory. Uh, another way of kind of stretching our experience or an existence is, A, I do a lot of public speaking. I try to engage communities, colleges, universities, and lectures as much as possible. And then I also launched the NOMA National Vimeo page using my NOMA historian hat. And here I've put up lectures, panel discussions, uh, testimonials of architects of color speaking to their contributions to the world, to the built environment, um, things outside of Jedi issues, because I promise you we can talk about more things than that. Uh, when we first launched it last year, we had about 1,200 views, and now we're at almost 16,000 views, which is amazing. Uh, the National, the Smithsonian, the National Museum of African American History and Culture, actually listed our Vimeo page as a resource and hyperlinked it back to our page. Um, and so having them even identify this as an important resource has been amazing. So if you haven't been perusing in here, I highly recommend Noma Vimeo page, Noma National Vimeo page. And then to bring it all back full circle, I went back to Pratt when I was the president of the New York chapter of NOMA and said, let's host a young designers conference for diverse students in uh, downtown Brooklyn. And there we were able to uh, engage 58 students and have 25 speakers. We even had a college and high school student design competition. And by doing that, we actually started to teach those college kids an important lesson that they were already at a position to mentor and to share their knowledge. Those high school kids found more weight in, in, in the answers that they gave than they could ask me who graduated a billion years ago, right? And so really saying that you do not need to be, you know, 99 years old and about to retire before you can start giving back, that every step you take, you can be taking the next generation with you. Then we got you in school, we got you graduated, now we got to get you a job. So we hosted programming such as crafting the interview, where we had HR managers, recruiters, people were in charge of hiring on a panel that talks about what they're looking for in those emails, what they're looking for in the cover letters and portfolios and such, and created mock interviews and so that we can explain and give tidbits and rules and ideas of what they needed to do to land not just a job, but a place where their career can flourish and they can continue to be invested in and do great work. Also uh, trying to think about how do I educate as much people as possible. I'm leveraging social media for social change. We have the Beyond the Built IG page. Um, we launched that in December of 2018. And every week we feature a different diverse designer. As of right now, we have over 5,000 followers and almost 100 uh, part person mark of featured designers. So no repeats so far. And it lives on the grid so that you can go and explore everything all the way going back. So if you can, please follow Beyond the Built. I highly recommend it. Every week, a different diverse designer takes it over from all over the world and shows you their work, shows you their journey, shows, shows you who they are and how they got there and their ethos for architecture and design, landscape, interiors, students. And it's important because we're flexing that muscle for them to get used to sharing their story, to putting themselves out there, as well as creating a community, a coalition of people who care to hear about those, those stories and to hear about those voices, hear those voices. Also, we featured over 16 exhibitions now with another five planned for the end of this year and early next year. Um, so I thought to myself, all these amazing content just can't live on my little laptop here. We need to put it someplace safe, someplace visible. And leveraging since Google said no place calls us great, I launched the Great Diverse Designers Library uh, where it's showing you um, not just headshots and numbers of of diverse people, but you get to click and it's sequenced by name and by location. And when you click it, you get to see 
our faces, you get to see um, more about us, our contributions and our work. Um, and so currently as of this moment, we have 421 featured designers on the page um, and I, it's completely free, completely accessible for you all to enjoy and leverage and use as well. And like we talked about the heartbreak that was Say It Loud Ohio, um, that's how I started actually the beginning of my quarantine time was uh, converting all of my past exhibitions into virtual exhibitions online. So before you would go on the webpage and you would say Say It Loud New York and you would just see photos of the exhibition. Now you can go and you'll see thumbnails and of each designer and when you click on them, it takes you to that same profile page that feeds the great diverse designers library. So what you're seeing here on the lower right hand side of your screen are all the different virtual galleries and exhibitions that we have so please feel free to explore have fun and enjoy. The ultimate goal because you know we're on my cyan page here is to publish a great diverse designers book. The maps that you're seeing on your left hand side, the spaces in orange is not your electoral map. This is all the spaces that we have actually captured in the uh, library. So I love the fact that it's not just the West Coast and the East Coast and it doesn't stop beyond there too. So we have literally a global reach and I'm really aiming to try to uh, capture people from every continent, inhabitable continent in the world. Our ancestors are heroes and we are their legacy. So what's stopping us from getting licensed? What's stopping us from getting there, right? And so according to NAB, it can take anywhere between 11 to 12 and a half years to become a, a licensed professional. For me, that took me 13 years. Um, and I'm somebody who always knew she wanted to be an architect. So five years to get my bachelor's degree in architecture from Pratt, one year master's degree at Columbia University. I knocked out my IDP in three years, I was not playing. But those ARE exams took me four years of constantly nonstop taking of tests. I took 14 tests before I passed the seven that was required. Um, there was a lot of tears there, but determination to make it happen. Um, and then, so that's a long time to commit to uh, getting to a profession. Then according to NAB, it can cost anywhere between 40 to $230,000 to become, uh, to get your degree and become a licensed architect. Um, for me, it cost $67,000. I thought that was crazy. I have a 30 year pay, payback plan. Um, my son who is four will be attending and enrolled in college and I will still be paying Sally May back, which is crazy. And now as I talk to students, I thought I was, you know, tab with 67, but I'm hearing people are graduating with six figures in debt already. So we are asking for a very long time commitment and a very long financial investment in becoming an architect. And when you graduate, we come out making anywhere between 46 to $51,000 a year. And that's if the economy is doing great, right? Whereas in comparison to comparable professions like lawyers and doctors that have similar lengths of time and education investment, they come out already making the six figures. The next thing I hear is like, okay, well, Pascal, how do we introduce the profession to little kids of color that don't know about architecture? And I try to make sure it is clear. It's not that we don't know about architecture, is that there's a negative relationship with architecture, that we deal with a built environment that fails us in many ways, that oppress us in many ways. We deal with the, you know, where our, our water park is a fire hydrant, our playground is the asphalt, and our gym is our front stoop. Right. Um, and then when there is construction, there's scaffolding up for like decades. Um, there's detours, there's debris, there's rodents, there's noise, right? There's all these things. And when that's finally done, the project that is revealed that is has kind of unearthed is not typically for that local community, right? And it's actually a signifier that they need to, to leave and that their culture has been erased from this place that has been their home and their neighborhood. And so understanding that there are 115,000 architects in the United States, there are currently 2%. Thank you, Noma, for keeping the directory alive so we can keep track. And five of them, 500 are African-American living women architects. And I'm 315. Uh, and so I'm really proud to claim that and to own that and to share that because boy, did it take a lot to get there um, that we exist and we're doing great work. Um, and then I also try to stay as visible to the community as possible. I participate in uh, parades throughout my neighborhood. 
uh, with hard hats and I scream, you can be an architect, yes you can. And if a kid goes, I wanna be an architect, we make a scene, it's amazing. Um, I protest, right? So I'm part of organizations, I'm a member, I have the right to push you to do more, to be better. So I protest those as well. And I share my story and represent the profession however and whenever I can. I also make room for our experiences. So even getting those no's, I was able to create these uh, beautiful panel discussions as well as having lecture series in partnerships with uh, AIA in New York that allows us to have continued relationships and conversations about these prolific architects and keeping their understandings and ethos alive through conversations with more contemporary practicing designers like we did with the J Max Bond lecture series that just celebrated their ten, our 10 year relationship with this initiative. Um, and then I want to talk about the idea of erasure. Architect Magazine had a, uh, had a panel discussion with five speakers. And those are the five that you see on the stage here in the center of your screen. And they recorded the, 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 the panel. And then when they publicly released it, they completely edited out Justin Garrett Moore, which is the brother in the middle with the pink shirt. And in all of the clippings, they cut off all of his answers and his presence on stage. And the only time you actually got to see him in this video is his shadow when they zoomed into one of the other speakers or one of the, the panels or questionnaire. Um, and then Justin told them, hey, y'all uh, erased me, crickets, crickets. And then 2020 happened, things started to get more uh, noticeable and aware. And so they released this beautiful article that basically said it was a lapse in judgment, that it was somehow a, an easy button was triggered and just erased him from this entire footage. So not only are they erasing you, but then they're letting you know that, oh, it, it, you know, it's not on purpose. Then same institution, same magazine, did another panel discussion that you're seeing on the right hand side of your screen. They interviewed these four people, had great conversations about it. And then when it got published, guess who fell off the page again? This is insane. So I want you to understand it's not just a matter of us getting content and putting it out there, that there's literally a force of erasure that we are fighting against and trying to push forward. And so we need to protect our history as well. So when articles are being put out, usually in haste for February, for Black History Month or in March for Women's Month, there's a lot of crazy information that goes out there and most of it's not really vetted. So I make it a point to mark it up to cold graphics and hold people accountable and say, no, you need to correct this and you need to correct this now. And not just to complain for the sake of complaining, but actually from that point, launching it as a, a way to uh, create a MOU with people to create relationships to provide content moving forward. So now we are able, the historian seat of NOMA is able to provide articles to NCARB that are vetted, that are white papers from our members and are of topics and the issues that we find really important. Um, and then my ultimate goal for this really is to create a relationship with publications that um, speak to our, our existence and making sure that they help us in amplifying our existence in the profession. So one thing that I launched is part of my dismantling injustice campaign was a say it with me, say it with media, if you will. And with that, I've asked media publications to do a few things. A, be transparent and do an audit uh, that speaks to tracking the amount of women and people of color that they feature in their publication and increasing it by 5% annually until a minimum of 15% is reached. Two, uh, create more content that lists us as great. And if you don't use the G word, that's fine. Use the same vernacular, use the same energy that you do when you design or describe uh, other uh, designers. Also leveraging their resources to create researching and development of historical content. A lot of my work really does capture contemporary practicing, but we've been here doing amazing things. So let's get that too. And then also create content that helps speak and educate to how architecture is used to facilitate oppression. So when we talk about justice, equity, diversity, inclusion work, we almost all talk about it from an exclusively of firm culture and how we the practice is run but I really wanna start talking about architecture or the built environment and how that can preserve the statements in history and context as well. So before I talk about what I want architecture to do, I wanna just talk about how it is used to oppress, just in case there's any doubters in the audience. 
Um, so one important figure is Robert Moses, definitely in New York. This is a person that was, you know, spoke. So it was like this amazing person, the best thing since sliced bread. He designed, you know, Central Park and a lot of our green and public spaces. He actually decimated a lot of African-American communities to create these things that we all are enjoying. But also, I really didn't realize and understand how racist he was. So in the planning and development of Jones Beach, he did not want Black people to come and frequent at the beach. Um, and so he understood that their main mode of transportation was buses. So he mandated that all of the overpass bridges, 20 of them, uh, over the southern state be constructed uh, nine feet or lower. So this is 20 overpass bridges that is literally constructed, built to oppress, to stop the access to a public beach. Then you have projects that have poor doors and market rate doors, which is crazy to me because these developments couldn't even happen had they not had an affordable component that came with those benefits, right? Whether it's additional FAR or, or whatever, open space or, or a reduction in, in fee. So having a poor door for those who are market rate and a, a front door for those who have who are paying um, higher fees is the equivalent of having whites only, coloreds only entrances, in my opinion. Um, there's also gentrification, there's redlining, there's many ways where architecture is used to oppress. Um, one of the most amazing projects ever is the National Memorial for Peace and Justice, also known as the Lynching Museum. There was a lot of protests when this uh, museum was opened, uh, pushing back, well, why would we want to have a, a piece of architecture that speaks to such a disturbing past um, that it, it doesn't make sense? Well, first of all, lynching is not past, right? It's very much present as we've all seen, right? Um, and these pieces of metal that's hanging from the ceiling are inscribed with names of people who had families, who had loved ones, who they were taken away from. And those dates that are inscribed in their locations are not from 50 years ago, but from a few years ago and last year, almost in some places, right? So if you are upset and angry by metal hanging from a roof or from a ceiling that I need you to bring that same energy when black bodies are swinging from trees. Now you're like, wow, Pastor, you're really dramatic. But let's talk about that some more. In 2017, an eight-year-old boy was literally uh, lynched by a series of high school kids who thought it was funny in front of his 11-year-old sister. Luckily for us, they did not tie the noose correctly. So he fell from the tree and survived. But you're watching and looking at pictures of this little chocolate baby's neck with rope burns all around from, from being hung. And listening to the local law enforcement talk about how they're not going to press charges on those kids because they're good kids, right? And so this is New Hampshire. And this is 2017. So again, we need to understand that there are a lot of harm that is happening and architecture has the ability to tell that story and make it prominent and make it aware and make us uncomfortable. It's also evident and has been proven that textbooks are being rewritten to remove the word slavery or slave and replace with unpaid laborer. And photos of slavery with black people dressed in their Sunday best having picnics in the field. I am not kidding. Again, a whole other uh, lecture. I say this to say, if our education system is erasing what slavery was and misinforming uh, what the horrific nature of it, then it is the responsibility of our architecture and our spaces to keep that history, to claim those spaces and to hold that story. The National Museum of African American History and Culture, uh, it dates back to 1915 when they first requested this museum and they were told African Americans have not done anything of significance for society to justify a museum on the mall. So the museum itself is a 100 year advocacy effort. Then it's a product that was designed by an incredibly talented diverse team. Then it's a project that holds and elevates and educates about the contributions of African Americans to society. And then it is actually the space that we can send our artifacts, can send our memorabilia, things that are important that speaks to that history and has an archive that keeps those components safe. And maybe one day be elevated to an exhibition platform for all to see, right? So this is a really important kind of space. Then you have the National Center for Civil and Human Rights. I know I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna speed through this a little bit, 
but again, about spaces that transform experiences. And so one specifically that I wanted to talk about is this counter uh, exhibition where you sit, you put your hands down, put your headphones in, and it mimics the experience of those who used to protest and sit in diners and have that respect. And the chair vibrates underneath you and you're hearing that you don't belong here, you're a dog, you're all these things and you're hated and you hear dishes being thrown and broken and your hands is on the counter and there's a stop clock in front to see how long you can take it. And um, I personally did not last long at all. I was very much in tears, but I thought, wow, how a built environment can transition and transform that experience to me, a fraction of what that was and how much it devastated me. It was really important and powerful to understand the power of space. Then embedding our heroes. So J. Max Bond Jr., uh, we were able to be part of the team to get a 162nd Street in St. Nick renamed J. Max Bond Jr. Way. And hopefully when the community members uh, see that name and they do their research, they learn about another local hero um, who's really in transformed our, our community. Uh, African Burial Ground National Monument is my first ever project when I was an intern at Schools of Architecture. And this site, this property, um, while they're excavating for yet another federal building, they came across a few uh, slave remains, which they continued to kind of chuck out the door until, uh, or throw away until the whistle were blown. Uh, Howard University came over and really went through the site and was able to identify hundreds of African remains and uh, date and age them between eight months old to 60 years old, like really a breath of uh, lifetimes within here. Um, but what we did with this project is actually we inscribed on the chamber uh, here, the entire map of downtown Manhattan and the entire extents of the African burial ground and the estimated 20,000 African remains that is there. So every federal, uh, sorry, every building, every piece of architecture that you see around you in any of these photos were physically, literally, conceptually, every lee you can think of built on the remains of our ancestors. Our people weren't just buried in this one little lot. All of downtown Manhattan is built on their backs. And what does that mean? Foundations were poured around their remains. And just kind of thinking about that. So this one small lot has the power to tell that story, keep that history and create that education component. So those who visit this site, visit this monument, can learn from it and bring that history and that component with you. And the green mounds that you're seeing here on the right hand side here on your screen, those are those same remains reinterred uh, on site in a respectful manner to make sure that you understand when you come to this monument, this is not where you go on a date, this is not where you skate, this is not where the party's at, this is a place of remembrance and, um, and it, it's important, incredible. Uh, also leveraging me being an ACE mentor and post the earthquake in Haiti in 2010, where I lost a lot of family. Uh, I was able to design a campus uh, that was replacing a school that had collapsed during the earthquake and really allowing both my mentoring volunteering side and my diaspora being a, a person of Caribbean heritage to be able to give back in that capacity was really important as well. There's also environmental justice, right? So 888 Boylston is the highest performing speculative office building in all of New England. Um, it's a great project, I love it, but it's really talking about how architecture can give back to the space of sustainability um, and not just take away from their context and their site. Uh, Bronx Point is my project that I'm working on right now, which is a 542 affordable housing unit, the first ever brick and mortar hip hop museum, community facilities, retail components on a park adjacent to the Mill Pond Park, shore public par parkway, waterway, um, upland connections and public plaza. And it's really powerful because even the concept for the project was hip hop and how we embedded that into the building. So we took the culture of the community and we engaged it in a 3D spatial part. We also did a lot of community engagement to hear what they were looking for, what they needed, what were their preferences and what they were looking for. And it's a really great project that speaks to uh, anti-gentrification and embedding the local culture and history since hip hop was born in the Bronx and having that be a prominent story that's being told through the built environment. And when you look at the product that this rendering on the lower left hand corner, you're not thinking, oh, look, there's another set of projects, right? You look at that and say, wow, that's a beautiful design um, to give a sense of pride and quality of space in homes to 542 families. Um, one of my aspirations, again, is replacing oppressive monuments with our leaders and community spaces. You know, it means something when uh, people who fought vehemently to maintain slavery, um, that enjoyed raping your, you know, your, your, your ancestors, men and female, 
um, be put at the highest pinnacle spaces in your community, in your city, is a statement of how limited your freedom is um, and keeping your place. So I really appreciate the initiatives that's been happening really a lot in 2020, although it's been happening way before, about us reconsidering those spaces and claiming them to be spaces that could be potentially given back to the community. And then architects as activists. Um, there's a few introductions here I want to just give you. Uh, Beverly Willis, she's phenomenal. She has the Beverly Willis Architecture Foundation. Um, she, as an architect, understood one of the main ways of changing our profession was actually through the client. So she went to all of her developer clients and said, can you pledge to not, uh, once she retired, can you pledge to not hire um, architecture firms that don't have women in uh, places of leadership, partner and principal level at their firms? Excuse me. So now all these firms that were used to getting repeat multi-million dollar projects from developers weren't able to get them anymore because they didn't have that leadership. So guess what they did? They found the women in their offices. They mentored them and pulled them up to those leadership positions and not just put them in a chair as a prop, but had to train them, had to talk, tell them what to do because partner principle means equity, right? So she really leveraged her position and her relationships and her network to create hundreds of opportunities for women across the country to get elevated uh, in their firms and break that glass ceiling. Uh, the National Organization of Minority Architects that I've referenced a lot called NOMA. This is the organization that I was just voted president elect. We just celebrated, no, well, sorry, next year we'll be celebrating our 50th anniversary of an organization that has been doing this work, um, who has always been fighting for justice, equity, diversity, inclusivity. So if you want to, I highly recommend that you get involved especially as things are digital and virtual, you can get be involved from home. Um, a part of the main uh, NOMA, NOMA programming is Project Pipeline. This was the camp that I was telling you about in the beginning in the introduction about how we got to engage students, introduce them to architecture, teach them about it, and then they present back to us how they're gonna use architecture to solve the issues of their community and, and align in it. So again, it's really dope. They've been doing a lot of virtual project pipelines. So if you can, I highly recommend that you uh, participate and volunteer. There's Tiffany Brown, uh, 400 Forward out of uh, Detroit, Michigan. Um, she, instead of trying to do touch one touch with like a thousand kids, her thing was what if every year I take on a cohort of six or seven uh, women who are interested in architecture, take them to lectures, construction sites, architecture firms, or really talk to them and introduce them to architecture, write their recommendation letters, teach them about the softwares that we use, and really be a, a constant presence in their life. And her goal was getting us to the next 400. So we got 100 down, another 300 to go. Uh, Brian Lee Jr. out of New Orleans, uh, Louisiana, has the Design as Protest and Design Justice National Movement, where what he does is have community meetings and just has the community talk about whatever is bothering them, not necessarily architectural specific or related, but what are the issues and challenges of that society, of that group, and then leveraging all of our skill sets as designers, critical thinkers, problem solvers, synthesizers, communications, graphics, um, to help and, and um, help strategize with the community how we can solve those issues. Sometimes that might be an architectural intervention, sometimes it's not. Um, but it's the idea that we can be a resource and we can leverage our entire palette of tools um, to help society move forward and better. Uh, the Hip Hop Architecture Camp with Mike Ford, uh, he's amazing. He introduces architecture to students by having them play with Legos and explaining having them explain why they did those moves. And then he hands out lyrics of hip hop and rap songs that says architecture or architect somewhere in there. And the kids have to quantify kind of color code or digest the information and the kind of syncopations or the rhyme structure or schemes of such. And when you compare like an Eminem song to a Lauryn Hill song, kind of seeing the layers of information that's embodied in that. Then they take that same information and they extrude through Tinkercad, a software that's free online, and they create cities based off of the music. So they're starting to learn about con constant thinking and seeing more layers of information in something that's so familiar to them, hip hop. Then he introduces or invites a local um, a musician from that community, a celebrity, a celebrity musician from that community to come and talk about music and hip hop. And then the kids actually write a song or perform a song that they write about how they're gonna use architecture to, to uh, solve their issues. So when I participated in the Bronx, New York uh, hip hop architecture camp, you know, these kids are rapping about how they're going to use architecture to solve teen pregnancy and drug addiction 
it's amazing. So A, I highly recommend you check out all the music videos and just be inspired. And then also they're hosting a lot of virtual um, camps. So if you can volunteer and participate, I highly recommend. And then we have the See It Loud Augmented Reality app in camp. Um, this is again, me leveraging all the content that I get from the Say Aloud exhibitions. It kind of performs like a Pokemon Go, if you will, where it tells you about projects around you that are designed by women and people of color. When you get there, you click on it, you get to see the names and faces of those who are there. And you're able to draw and create illustrations and capture a picture of it with your mobile device and see it 3D imposed on the building at one-to-one -one scale. So you really educating and empowering through design and augmented reality. So the Beyond the Built Environment has three main components. We have the See It Loud Augmented Reality app in camp, which is more focused to teens and preteens, most likely to have a mobile device. Uh, Say It Loud for professionals and students. Um, and that's again about exhibitions and elevating their work. And then Learn Out Loud to the pop-up book, which is more focused for small kids um, and, and children. And so again, trying to create that full gamut and pipeline of, of inspiring, getting one involved. Um, the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in the moment of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at the time of challenge and controversy. Um, many, many moons ago, I was asked to stand and I've been standing up for justice and equity, diversity and inclusion in our profession. Um, and I hope today you choose to stand with me. Thank you. Pascal, that was absolutely amazing. And I have a feeling everyone is at home clapping right now. <laughs> Um, I just feel like that after finishing that way, you must, if you've done this kind of speech before, you must have gotten just rousing standing ovations because, wow. Oh, thank you. I mean, it's it, the, the, the presentation is constantly evolving because every time I get a new say aloud, every time something mm -hmm. cyan turns into yellow, I got to, you know, create the next cyan. So the idea is that it's a constant work in progress, right? And I'm sharing right. my journey and my genesis what started it all and why you know one of the most common questions i get is why do you include women not just people of color and i said because the teacher said i couldn't because i was a woman and because i was black so i'm elevating both women and people of color right right, so right. this is very personal um but the goal of it is really it's about elevating others well it's incredible and i think um you know, the, the power of design, not just in architecture, but graphics, graphic design, um, web design, user interface, like it's incredible what you're bringing to the effort, right? I mean, that doesn't that make a big difference? That we have, right? It's like, and, that, and that's why mm -hmm. I, I thought what Brian Lee was doing in, in, in uh, Louisiana was so smart because he's saying, yeah, we can do things beyond just build buildings, right? We can bring all that skill set and that tools to society. How are we, not, not how are we, we are irrelevant in the fight for civil rights and justice. We're completely irrelevant because we wait till we receive an RFP or RFQ and get engaged. Whereas we really can be engaged and be a leaders in a lot of this discussion if we choose to show up for people in that capacity. That's right. Yeah, and, and there's been a lot about architects, um, you know, what projects do architects work on? Uh, I remember a few years ago, it was like, should black architects work on prisons? You know, so it's like making a statement um, so on what, my, my what projects you take. My, my answer to that question is we should all stop designing jails, <laughs> prisons, and places of detention and start mm -hmm. leaning into restorative justice work and creating a new typology for what we need. We need to understand that literally within 30 years, we went from 200,000 beds to 900,000 beds. And right. private prisons have an 80% to 100% occupancy requirement. So every time we build and construct these pieces of architecture, we are creating the force that's extracting black bodies from their communities, from their families, and putting them into modern slavery so that they can create jeans and underwear for like 15 cents to the dollar, which is essentially right. what's the, the financial backing behind this. And then whenever they are creating those buildings or constructing it, then you have lobbyists that are creating laws that change offenses from fines into minimum days in prison or in jail. This is all that prison pipeline and carceral state issues that we need to dismantle and architects need to claim our role in it. And that's why 
as an AIA yeah. New York Board of Director, I was part of the effort that got the AIA New York statement to go asking us to step away from that effort. And honestly, I was on a call this week um, about putting that same information to the Biden-Harris administration. I'm not playing. Wonderful. I really want us to start rethinking how we engage the built environment. We do, need, do not need to be locked into a typology because it's familiar. We need to see what society yeah. needs and have architecture meet that requirement. Wonderful. I, kudos. Um, well, let me ask one of our audience questions. Please. Um, Rita said, gentrification is a big and controversial topic in the field of historic preservation. Mm -hmm. Could you share any thoughts or observations about historic, how, how you think historic preservation can work with communities to, dis, to prevent displacement and exclusion? You know, it's really about policy building, I think. Like when I think about people like Maurice Cox and R. Stephen Lewis, who was running the city planning of Detroit, they had instituted a mm -hmm. zero displacement policy. So developers, as they were creating their performers and envisioning what they can do with the different properties, they had to be inventive and creative. And guess what? They made it happen. They were able to offer up projects that uh, took into consideration not just new people that they were bringing in, but accommodating the culture and the community that's there. Um, one of the really exciting conversations that I had with the preservation team here in New York is that they started creating an app that starts talking about identifying places of historical significance and preservation and kind of getting that information more live and accessible. So you understand why those spaces are important and why mm -hmm. they're being preserved. But I also wanna talk about like, not just the, the architectural technique to make it preserved, but what happened there, right? Events that happened that make a space or a place um, viable um, to be preserved as well. And also how does the built environment keep history of what's happening, right? I often think mm -hmm. about where Trayvon Martin was murdered, right? What is that space now? Is that a, a piece of grass? Is there a plaque there? How is, if the, if the built environment keeps erasing really important tears in our community, then we again, essentially continue to create that problem. So I think um, making information more accessible about the importance of preservation and what we're doing in the culture that we're imb embedding is important. Those who are making the decisions of what qualify um, as historical content that should be preserved um, needs to be diverse, right? So that they can see a community mm. and, and a space that is from a diverse group or a socioeconomically challenged space and be like, no, this is of value, this is of importance, right? So there needs to be that diversity right. there. And then also potentially capturing historical moments that part of why it's being landmarked and why it's an important space and what it needs to be kind of maintained as the education system of that development. Right, great. Well, and you just you know gave a little plug for our, our thing tomorrow at three, which is who decides what to preserve. So we're gonna have a great panel discussion about that. Absolutely. Um, you know, and speaking of erasure, I, I followed that story about um, the erasure of, erasure of Justin Garrett Moore on Twitter. And I was just stupefied. I mean, it was really shocking. Um, so that leads me to a question, and you you just you talked about um, you know be, when you were asked to stand in school, so that like affects how many architects of color get through school, right? Um, does do you see racism actively affecting the success of architects of color? Absolutely. Today, yes. I, I Is that a you big know it's it's interesting because you know I talk about that moment. Um, as giving me such prominence in my purpose, right? It made me realize that I was representing, but it also is a very heavy weight. So if I'm not feeling well and I don't wanna to go to class, I'm like, oh crap, I can't be the black girl that don't go to school, right? And even in a professional setting that starts to feed towards my imposter syndrome, right? Oh, I can't be the, the only person of color here and not know how to draw this or not know how this should be done. And so I, I, I must not be, a value item, I must be lying, right? Or, you know, it just, it, it's, it's, it's constantly in my conscious. It's something that I'm constantly aware of. It's a weight that I carry. And that's something about 2020 that has been interesting is because I've been, you know, I would code switch depending on who I'm talking to. There was a different energy, it was a different stuff. My hair would be very different depending on, you know, it, it's just all those things that I said, you know what, I'm too tired to put up the second part of me or version of me for your consumption, for your ease and comfort. Here's who I am um, authentically, right? Um, and then when you think about erasure in education, erasure in publication, 
who's getting the awards, who's getting, because getting an award or being on cover magazine is nice, but it's not just why you do it. It's because it's business development. So if the best architects are the same eight people, then that's the legacy of the people who get the work, right? And then when you think about city agencies and who they, they hire on their, you know, their cycle of contracts, what is the demographics of the firms that are getting consistent government multi-million dollar projects? And when you start doing those audits, it is very clear that there's a lot of racism embedded in there. And when you try to push for opportunities for women-owned com uh, companies or minority-owned companies, there's a lot of pushback. It's just, it just, it's just so happens that I have no problems pushing uh, for what I think is right as well. And I think the more you ask for transparency, um, people to put up what their boards look like, to put up what their percentages are, it reveals a lot. And I think that's why there's a big hesitation against that right now. Mm, wow. Thank you for pointing out how racism really does play a role. That's really. I guess it's not shocking. It's unfortunate that it's still such a factor. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I looked up your Black Architects uh, website, and there are two Black licensed architects in Rhode Island. I know one of them, he works for the state. I don't know the other one, but I will make an effort to get to know him. Um, and, you know, Providence is a majority minority city. Um, the school system is about the public school system, at least 75% um, students of color. And we have a great chapter of ACE here, mm -hmm. um, which you know. Um, and I know they work with a lot of students of color. We don't have a chapter of NOMA, but I know there's one in Boston. How could like the Preservation Society where I work in ACE um, do more to encourage the students in our schools to think about architecture as a career or design generally? I mean, it's you know, we value design and architecture so much here, but it's, you know, the historical um, mostly, but also we value good new design as well. But, you know, how do we, how do we get those kids thinking about that? Sure. I think, you know, again, one of the, one of the positive things in 2020 here is that so many things have transitioned to be a virtual platform that mm -hmm. you are able to really leverage a larger community um, to have a local kind of impact. So having Zooms that have like a project pipeline that's focused on your elementary school kids that could be excited about it is a, a way of doing it without necessarily having the embodied uh, people there is a possibility, but also having those conversations, like ask them, what's architecture to you? Are you excited about it? Why not? Um, does my experience in terms of what architecture means um, and having a negative uh, impact to communities do they see that? Do they reflect that? Do they not even, even consider that? And why not, right? And so I think it's important that whenever you're trying to solve, serve a community, whether it's through architecture, whether it's through design, whether it's through advocacy, the first thing you gotta do is ask that community, right? Ask those professors, those teachers, those principals, you know, what do they need? What would make this um, important? What would, what would make this successful? What would make this reach inspiration level for these kids? And then plan mm -hmm. accordingly together. Um, you know, best of intentions don't hold up if you don't actually engage the people that you're, you know, you're, you're working towards. You don't want to like, hey, I made something for you, didn't ask you, don't know if it's your favorite color, here you go, you're welcome, and then bye, right? So right. you really yeah. want to ask, what's your favorite color? What's happening? What's homes to you? What's and, and ask those conversations and then engage communities and organizations and institutions who have been doing the work, who have that information and is very happy to share and engage communities all over. Um, and again, Boss Noma is one of the Noma chapters under my leadership as or jurisdiction as a Northeast Regional. So I highly recommend that you reach out to their current president, which is Edward Ransom, also known as Tony. Um, and engage, and I'm sure that they would love to, to participate however you need them as well. Okay, great, great. And I should mention, we do have another organization called Down City Design that's led mm -hmm. by our, an architect. And um, I, they, I'm sure they do some work in encouraging the kids to think about architecture. So I should not exclude them. <laughs> um, well, I, the, you know, I don't see any more questions. Um, a lot of kudos on your talk. Thank it's you. amazing how much energy you have. <laughs> um, I was just reading reading Stacey Abrams' Wikipedia page, and I think the two of you are right up there and like apparently never sleeping and over accomplishing. So thank you for everything you're doing. <laughs> um, 
Oh, let's see. Rachel just asked a question. Uh, have you heard of any curriculum changes in architecture? I guess in architecture schools that actively incorporate the work of Black architects. Oh, any level of our education. So I'm working on the book. I'm actually trying to ink a book deal uh, to get that uh, that cyan page yellow, right? Trying to make that happen. Um, mm -hmm. And to do that, right. I actually spoke to a lot of chairs, deans, head of um, architecture schools, design schools, interiors, uh, urban planning to get a sense of what they need, what's the kind of content they're looking for, um, centered around the diverse uh, representation. So. Um, so it's women and BIPOC designers, right? Black indigenous people of color is who is captured in my great diverse designers library and who I elevate in my very say it loud exhibitions. However, also being on the NOMA national board, it's put me in a position to be in conversations with NAB and NCARB and talking about accreditation requirements. And so it's not a matter mm -hmm. of just schools that, that agree that push this, but then becoming a requirement for schools to even maintain their accreditation, both in uh, content in terms of who's lecturing, the quantity of professors and their diverse uh, statistics, um, as well as the content. Mm -hmm. And then I'm also trying, and this is going to be another cyan page one day, is making and embedding this information as part of the licensing process. And that this book would be one of the requirements that people would need to study and understand how architecture is being used to facilitate racism, sexism, and oppression and um, what are methods mm. of counteracting that and having that be part of the licensure process. So, um, you know, step one is collecting Fantastic. content. Step two is trying to get content elevated as much as humanly possible. And then three, now leveraging that database yeah. to create critical content uh, that allows for education and really uh, addressing <laughs> those issues. Right. Do um, is is understanding history of architecture something that you're taught in architecture school? Is that a common sort of coursework for architects or history is, of architecture or not? Yeah. Yeah. That, I mean, do, do people the study the, the great architects? Oh, <laughs> that was the class. <laughs> that was wow. that class. Um, that was that class. But I think it's beyond just that, right? It's beyond the history architecture classes, it's also when you're in design studio, they'll say to you, oh, you should totally look at this Frank Lloyd Wright project. You should look at this Frank Gehry project. You should look and mm. it's like, okay, but nobody said, look at this Paul Revere Williams project or, you know, this Sharon Sutton project. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's centered around a particular group, all US focused. Like, you know, we rarely even learn about international designers and the work that they're doing and how they do it, right? And so that's why oh, I really wow. wanted the library to capture the full breadth of the, the world and not just a particular place because we can learn from it all, right? Um, and mm -hmm. so, um, yes, there are courses, but I think the problem is going back to Albert Schenker and this idea of not teaching about culture because you won't mm. become an American right. has played what's even been documented. When Google said there's not enough content out there and not, not enough content that even lists you all is great, this content that I'm gathering is new content. It's not that you have to be more specific mm. in your text when you Google it. People are creating you this have to for the create first it. time, right? Mm -hmm. I'm generating the content and putting it out there for that. And with the say it loud or say with media, excuse me, MOU, that's the biggest hesitation. They're like, you know, we are, we're down with everything you said, but what if we commit to this and we can't find the content? And I said, right. don't worry, we're saying it loud, right? And it's constantly building. Every time I do a new exhibition, there's more people there, more people to feature. And so I've been really happy to see publications reach out and ask, you know, here are the hyperlinks of the people we want to get more information with. Can you make introductions and be able to get more content, more papers, more lectures, more stuff really focused on great work and not just East Coast and West Coast, but the amazing talent in between. Right, wonderful. Uh, we have an official from um, our Providence Community Library System who's asking if you're aware of any library programs for kids about architecture, especially minority kids. Oh, so like you go to a library and you learn about architecture through there? Right. I don't, but I definitely don't know everything. I promise I don't. And I'm sure, you know, in different communities where there's leaders who are advocating for certain components, they would top, definitely be. Um, I just think it's matter, maybe a matter of just elevating their work whenever we can and how we can. So um, I don't know of anyone in particular or any uh, program in particular, but I don't doubt that there's something there um, that, that's out there that we can kind of leverage and, and utilize. 
and an opportunity for Providence libraries to maybe create something. Absolutely. And become the model Wonderful. for a national uh, effort, right? <laughs> that's, that's, that's right. That's right. Sue, I hope you're listening. <laughs> she that's said, are you, is, is Sue Gibbs? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, terrific. Well, um, thank you so much. This has been really inspiring. I'm glad that I was on, saw you on the panel, and I'm glad we got to hear more from you um, tonight. Um, thanks for kicking off our symposium. I think everyone who's here is inspired and uh, we've recorded it and we will share it um, following this symposium to more people. I know we had a lot of people who couldn't attend tonight. Um, so thank you from the bottom of our heart for doing everything you're doing to just elevate the discourse and the content. My absolute pleasure. I really, again, wanna thank you for the opportunity to engage your community and be the kickoff you know, conversation for your amazing symposium. I hope everyone has continued to be challenged and excited um, about the work and the work that we're doing. Oh, um, and I put in the chat ways of keeping in touch um, and places where you all could potentially submit for Say It Loud if there's any person out there who is excited or interested to do it, you can say it loud uh, now. Um, and participate there as well. So again, thank you so much for your time, um, for this platform and for elevating the story, my story. And um, I appreciate you. Thank you. I'm sure we'll see you again. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Have a great, have a great night.